Susie Homestead of the Rockies and welcome to the Susie Homesteader channel and today we're on part five of our wood so stove series and we're outside in the woodshed talking about different types of wood uh, hopefully you saw some of my other videos on our wood stove uh, series which included uh, how to start a fire in a wood stove how to buy and pick out a wood stove how to clean your wood stove, how to cook on a wood stove, and some other fun ones uh, about cast iron wear. Uh, and then again today we're going to talk about uh, just different types of wood, um, how to get your, your actual firewood, different ways to get your firewood, um, ways to store and stack your firewood, and uh, as soon as I can get it back out in the woods I'm going to get a video for you guys on how to actually cut down and fell trees and haul them off if you're actually cutting down your own firewood. So we'll get to a logging job next week which will be kind of fun but we're waiting for it to warm up a little bit. Uh, but in the meantime today we're going to talk about different kinds of firewood. Uh, you know in this part of the Rockies, up in the northwest corner of the Rockies, uh, we have real specific types of firewood. Um, and then, you know, over a, a national spectrum, your firewood's kind of divided into softwoods and hardwoods. Now, every part of the country has both of those in different species. Uh, and then within those species, they're kind of divided into western species of uh, wood or trees and then eastern species. Uh, so a couple different categories uh, of actual wood that we'll be talking about. Uh, and the, again, like I said, we're over here in the northwest corner. So some of our softwoods that we will actually be using um, for burning are going to include uh, Douglas fir, which is one of the main types of firewood here. Uh, we also have uh, western larch. We have a little bit of spruce, uh, but also predominantly pine. And we have lodgepole and we have uh, ponderosa <clears throat> that we burn a lot of. So it's really just kind of uh, how, where we're getting our firewood from and how available it is as to what types of firewood we have. Uh, you know, your first concern about firewood is really just how you're gonna get it. So there's one of two ways to do that. And number one is you're either going to buy it from somebody uh, that sells firewood and does that for a living, or you're going to go and get it yourself. So if you're going to go get your own firewood, um, you're either going to A, get permission from somebody who has some private land that's going to allow you to cut firewood off of, or B, you can go to public lands, uh, state lands, that you can uh, get a uh, wood cutting permit from your state uh, to actually be able to cut a certain amount of firewood uh, off of a state land. Uh, so two ways, either private or public lands, that you can get your firewood off of. Uh, and then, um, as I said, we'll do a video for you uh, after this one just on how to actually cut your own firewood and get it out uh, when we get to that logging job. Uh, but <clears throat> if you're going to buy firewood from somebody locally, uh, you, what you really just need to know is what a cord of wood actually equals. So a cord of wood is usually four feet wide, four feet high, and eight feet long when it's stacked and that would be kind of stacked loosely. Uh, and I'll have an image for you of that here on this video of kind of what that's supposed, that cord is supposed to look like. Uh, a cord of firewood will generally not fit in the back of a pickup truck. Um, so if somebody tells you they're delivering you a cord of firewood and it's just in the back of their pickup, it's probably not a true cord. So a true cord of firewood is about 128 cubic feet, uh, and that's what you're, you're paying for. Uh, when you are buying your firewood, uh, in this neck of the woods, like I said, we'll pay somewhere from like $150 to $180 uh, per cord, depending on what kind of firewood that is. Uh, now the softer woods, uh, like a Douglas fir, would be at the lower end of that, <clears throat> and a harder wood, uh, which sometimes can be considered a larch up here, 
uh, will be at the higher spec end spectrum of that. Uh, but really, like I said, in this part of the Rockies, the only two kinds of hardwoods that we have are aspen and birch. And those are generally pretty small trees uh, and not that common that people use for firewood. Usually that just comes off of your own personal piece of property uh, if you have some laying around. Uh, but generally what you'll buy is some form of a pine. So as you can see behind me, uh, this is kind of a mix of all kinds of different firewood. Uh, and you can certainly tell by the age on some of these. Now this is almost rotten because you can kind of see uh, some of that wood starting to deteriorate on the inside. Uh, and then some of it is much newer and you can tell that because of the density and it's less porous and much harder. Uh, some of this you can tell is a blue pine because of the, the gray that's in that pine. Uh, and then, you know, just obviously all different kinds of variations of wood. Most of this is some kind of a, a pine or a larch. Uh, as I said, the larch here is not, this is larch here. This is actually not considered really a hardwood here, but some people do uh, consider, it's also called tamarack, uh, a hardwood here. And it is denser. It is much denser than something like, uh, you know, a pine, as you can kind of see by the ends of this. Uh, now on a hardwood, you're going, a hardwood is going to burn uh, longer, but not as hot. And a softwood in your fireplace is going to burn faster and hotter. So you really kind of want a little bit of both when you're picking out your firewood, if you can get that. You know, try and get two kinds of wood. Uh, just because that way at night you can burn the harder woods, not necessarily hard wood, but the harder, denser wood like a larch, uh, because that will burn longer for you overnight. So lots of things to consider. Like I said, number one, how are you going to get your wood, uh, whether it's privately or publicly, uh, what you're going to pay for it, uh, how much wood, like we talked about, is in a cord. And then in my particular case, uh, for say just a 1500 uh, square foot top level of a house that I'd be heating through the winter here, that would uh, take about five to six cords of wood per winter for us. Uh, and that is relying on only that one source of heat and not having any other backup heat uh, that I cho choose to use, even though I have a furnace because it's too expensive. Uh, so as I said, uh, five to six cords per winter is what we go through. Uh, that's burning it all day, all night, and uh, no secondary source of heat on a top floor. Now, I do have a two-story house, but the bottom of the house has heaters, so uh, that's a different story. But that's what it takes. Uh, for us to get through a winter. Now, uh, another thing I'll talk to you guys about is how to store your wood. Uh, but this particular wood shed that I have, uh, just to give you an idea of how much wood we have in here, even though we're obviously not going to use this in one winter, uh, this is a, the equivalent of a 24 by 24 uh, foot, almost two car garage is what this wood shed was built to be. Uh, the idea here with storing your firewood is just mostly the fact uh, that it's dry, kept dry, and there's also, as you can see, a lot of airflow through here. And that's just because I haven't chose to uh, cover up the sides of my woodshed yet, uh, because a lot of the wood that I put in here when I built this uh, was still green. And green meaning uh, new and not seasoned, and seasoned meaning that it's one or two years old. Uh, so if you don't want to have rot on your wood and uh, and maybe some of it's still green and you want it to dry out faster, uh, I wouldn't suggest having the building you're putting it in completely enclosed uh, because you do want a, as much airflow as you can get through all the cracks and all the firewood that you have stacked in here. Uh, now, this is not a perfect example of how to stack wood. <laughs> this is an example of how my teenage boys get through their chores as fast as they can. Oh, like that. <laughs> yeah, exactly, like what's on the ground, which was supposed to be, actually was stacked, but torn apart. Uh, anyway, this is not the best example of how to stack wood, but it's a lot of wood, uh, and it's got a lot of airflow, and um, there shouldn't be any mold in here. One thing I did do in this woodshed was uh, create a front door and a back door, and I'll, again, I'll have kind of a bigger image of what this woodshed lo shed looks like, just to give you an idea. Uh, most people's woodsheds are not this big, uh, but like I said, we kind of like to be prepared. So um, the front of this woodshed is for bringing in and delivering the actual wood, like through the front gates here that I have, that you just saw. That's how we get the wood in. <clears throat> On the back side of this woodshed, 
I have another opening uh, where we'll be taking uh, the older wood out first. So that's kind of something you might want to think about when you're designing your wood shed or your storage, whatever that is for your wood, uh, just so that you're constantly rotating your wood and again taking the older stuff out first and giving the greener stuff time to dry out. So that's just kind of common sense stuff. Um, you know, it's not rocket science, it's kind of easy to figure out. Um, if you don't have a building available to store your firewood, then just go get a tarp. Um, and if you can, the main idea is just to keep it off the ground so that the bottom layers of your wood are not getting moldy. <clears throat> so if you have pallets or you can just create some kind of a, uh, a system set up on the ground with two by fours uh, so that your wood is just basically off the ground and also has a little airflow underneath the wood as well. But certainly keep in mind the weight of what you're going to be putting on those pallets because it's going to get heavier and heavier as you're stacking it. Uh, but again, the whole idea is just to keep airflow <clears throat> throughout, you know, your wood pile and tarping it if you have to is fine. Again, like I said, just make sure there's some place for the air to get through. So lots of different ways to store your wood as well. And then obviously you're going to need a couple of really important tools for splitting your wood. So we have gone through, I can't tell you how many axes we've tried to use over the years, you know, old ones, new ones. Uh, you name it, but I will say that this Fiskars axe, uh, I don't know what we paid for that. I'm, I'm going to say like 60, 80 bucks or something. Um, anyways, this is absolutely the best axe we've ever bought and it's super sharp and, um, really lightweight, which is kind of nice. Um, so this Fiskars axe is a great tool to have. If you can get a hold of one of those, I'm pretty sure we got that at the hardware store. Um, and that'll be just for, uh, you know, splitting your bigger rounds into quarters. And then this, you're just gonna need a hatchet. You just need a little start, super uh, small hatchet for splitting your kindling. So I'll talk to you a little bit more about splitting wood when we get to the logging job, um, only because I wanna show you how you're actually gonna start uh, on, on splitting your wood up. So if you're starting with a chainsaw and cutting those logs into smaller pieces, uh, and then again, you want to kind of stick to uh, like 14 to 16 in inches in length, which as you can see is kind of, you know, what we're talking about right here. Uh, that's a little shorter. That's probably about 14 inches, uh, maybe even 12, but in our stove, it can go up to like 16 inches to get your wood in um, efficiently. So, you know, measure the inside of your stove diagonally and uh, both directions if you can, and just get an idea of what size wood uh, you want to fit in your stove because that's the lengths that you're going to cut your logs into. So, and then after you cut your logs, you're going to split them into quarters. And then some of those quarters you're going to split into kindling. Uh, it is kind of nice if you have a storage place for your wood to also have a place for kindling, which is a, what a lot of people forget about. So, um, in my case, unfortunately, I have so much wood stacked in here <laughs> that I have no place to put my kindling. Uh, but normally we have a whole area designated just for the kindling also. And something else you want to also consider is, uh, you know, keep some of those big stumps, those big rounds uh, for splitting your kindling on. And again, I'll have a little, <clears throat> a little bit more of a video for you on just how to, you know, split your kindling as fast as you can. Uh, but if you can leave some space in your woodshed, if it's big enough, uh, to also put some of your split kindling and also have a stump in there to split kindling if you can so you don't have to do that out in the snow and the rain in case you have to do some more of that in the middle of winter. So hopefully that'll answer some questions for you. Uh, come see me on my website, Susie Homesteader of the Rockies, where I'll have a complete supply list for you of some good things to have on hand uh, for acquiring your firewood and uh, a shopping link to go with it. So we'll see you there. Bye-bye. Good. Go. Got a big one. I <laughs> get into the big ones. <gasps> Come on. Three left. Oh. Nice. <laughs> <laughs>